Turn with me this morning to the book of Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy chapter 11, we'll begin uh, this morning. But we want to, uh, as we look at the book of Deuteronomy, we want to point out some very, a very simple, uh, uh, simple truth that we want to think about today. And as you look at the book of Deuteronomy, it would be good as you read through it to notice every time the word all is used. It's a very um, amazing thing the number of times the word all is used in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, <clears throat> we're going to start by turning to Deuteronomy chapter 19. Actually, that's not where we're going to start because I have the wrong reference. That's pretty bad. So we'll go back to Deuteronomy 11. I want us to notice in the chapter here the word all and its roots. Verse 8. Therefore shall ye keep all the commandments which I command you this day. <clears throat> Verse 22. For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to serve and to cleave unto him, <coughs> Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and each shall possess nations mightier than yourselves. Now, what is the world's perspective of God and religion? What is the world's perspective of God and religion? Well, the fact is, um, um, the world is very schizophrenic in this. You know, if, uh, if somebody wants their son to be a professional basketball player, probably um, they're going to give that little guy, when he comes home from the hospital, going to give him a little basketball. And his first birthday, he's probably going to get a little basketball. You know, and uh, his second birthday, he's going to get a little hoop on the door. You know, and, um, you know, made by the fifth birthday, um, they have a basketball hoop outside. And uh, you name it. He's going to learn how to dribble at two years old. And uh, um, I tell you what, uh, uh, basketball. You know what I mean? And you know, in the business world, you know, um, starting a business, that's uh, pretty tough. And you know what? Um, um, you know, it's normal that uh, if you're going to start a business, you're going to give it all that you got. You know what I mean? You're going to give it all that you got. And uh, at night, you're um, going to be reading, and at night you're going to be studying, and, and uh, you're going to be pl planning, and you're going to be thinking, and, and uh, during the day you're going to be giving all your time for contacts, and, and you know what I mean. You're just going to give it all you have. I mean, that's pretty normal, isn't it? Right? Give it all you got. And, you know, um, that's the way, you know, people think, you know, just give her all you got. 
But when it comes to God, no way. Now I just make sure you become very moderate in this thing. You know, moderation is the key. Moderation is the key. You know, a little bit beyond a little bit, that's okay. But beyond that, just moderation. You know? But you know, when it comes to the world, give her all you got. When it comes to God, better be careful now. Just take it a little bit at a time. Isn't that amazing? The contrast of thinking. You'd never be called an extremist if you were trying to start a business, gave it all you got. But with God, with God, oh, you don't want to, you got to be careful. Just a little bit, you know. Well, let's think about what God has to say. Let's think about what God has to say. Now we know how people think. We know how, we kind of know how the secular world thinks. But let's take a moment and look at the Bible and see what God says. Maybe that would be interesting. Well, I think we get a little bit of an idea what God says. He says when you go into the land, he says, keep all the commandments. Keep all the commandments. Verse 22, walk in all his ways. Hmm. And amazing, <coughs> completely opposite of what is normative in people's thinking. It goes against the very core of how human beings are. No wonder so few fulfill all of God's will for their life. As we look at the book of Deuteronomy, I can quote you the verse, but I can't give you the right reference because I got it messed up. He says, go in and possess all the land. Go and possess all the land. Now, of course... The land of Israel is a picture of God's plan for the people of God. It's a physical representation. It's a real thing. But for us, it's a physical uh, uh, representation of something that we can grab a hold of. Now, I said this in Sunday school. You know, I'm a, I'm a visual thinker. You know, I'm a visual thinker. And, um, and we have this picture of all the land that God wanted Israel to possess. This is a picture of all of God's will, all of God's plan uh, for your life as a believer. And he says, I want you to go and possess all the land. You know, so the minute you got saved, when were you saved? If you're saved. For the minute you got saved, Till the day you're going to die, God has a plan for your life and the end of your life. Um, that plan for God's for God for, of God for you, the the real reality of your success of your life. If you have filled fulfilled all that God planned for you. Now you go to Psalm 30, 139, It makes it clear. 
that uh, God said, David s- said of God, he says, all my members are written in a book. He says, while I was yet in my mother's womb, God wrote all my life in a book. What? It was his plan for my life. And um, in the specific sense, that will, for your life, begins the day you get saved. Now as God has a plan for your life. <clears throat> now remember, the world says, take it easy. Be moderate about this thing of religion. But everything in life, else in life, give it all you got. You know what I mean? Everything else in life, give it all you got. Oh, I'm sure there's students at the university, and uh, their idea is that the most important thing in life is to get an education. And so, man, they'll give everything they got to get a good education. You know, and other things uh, are secondary. And uh, <clears throat> that's, that's, you know, pretty typical secular thinking. Forget God. Think of, forget about anything else. You know, that's ah, the most important thing. But God has a plan for our life. And his, the key is for us is to possess all the land. <coughs> now, you know what? <clears throat> Young people. You know, it takes spirituality to think rightly if you're young. I got saved, accepted Christ, October 31st, 1968. That's the day. As a sinner realizing I was on my way to hell and I deserved to go to hell. And that my life was not pleasing to God. And I had a lot of things in my life that needed to change. And the reason my life was a mess is because I was the boss of my life, not Jesus. And I turned to Jesus Christ, received him as my Lord and my Savior, and I meant it. And that's the day I got saved. Wow. But you know, it was less than eight months after that that God called me to be a preacher. And so a little bit over a year after I got saved, I was in Bible college. And, um, and so for the um, next two and a half years, uh, I crammed uh, my Bible college into the curriculum. And I graduated from Bible college. But you know, when I went to Bible college, in chapel, the preacher would say, for instance, he would say, turn to the book of Malachi. And I'd take my Bible, and I'd hand it to the girl sitting next to me, and I'd go like this. I didn't know where that book was. I didn't even know it was there. Good thing he said Malachi. I probably thought it meant Malachi, you know. And if he said it was the book of Job, I probably thought it was Job, you know. And she'd just smile at me and open up the Bible to that book, and I'd find it. I knew nothing. I remember the preacher preaching on Daniel in the lion's den. And uh, I, after the end of the sermon, I said, man, oh, man, wasn't that great? <laughs> oh, man, that's exciting. I never knew about Daniel in the lion's den. I didn't know a thing about the Bible. And I always say, when I graduated from Bible college, I knew less about the Bible than any young person who paid attention in a good church. I knew less about the Bible than any young person who was serious and paid attention who went to a good church. And I've told young people throughout the years, if you would have listened closely in, in the sermons and in and Sunday school, by the time you were in 12th grade, you would have known 
uh, you would have known more, far more than I probably knew when I graduated from seminary. But you know, most people aren't very serious about life. Most young people aren't very serious about their Christianity. They think their Christianity starts somewhere down the road. No, God's will starts the moment you get saved. And your job is to possess all the land. Take advantage of every opportunity. You have to develop your life for God and do his will. You know, that's the difference between a secularist and a real Christian. A secularist, a person who lives like the world and yet is saved, they say, well, a little dab do you. Sorry, Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> little scrub, little scrub do you. <laughs> now, all the land, I wonder, I wonder, you know what? Poor old nation of Israel, did they ever inherit all the land? Did they ever come close? <clears throat> Only for a brief time under Solomon, but for all those years, no. Most generations of Israelites didn't inherit all the land. They came so far short of God's will. So, so far short of God's will. I'm afraid that that's the testimony of most Christians. I mean, today. Some could have come to Sunday school. They had every opportunity to come to Sunday school and learn about very important truth in the Bible, about strongholds. But, you know, it didn't take advantage of the opportunity. They had as much time as anybody else. They missed it. Wrong view of the Christian life. Wrong view of the Christian life. Will they possess all land? No, not a chance. Not unless that view changes. And so we need to see this huge difference between the picture that God paints... And the picture that man thinks. And so, it, uh, the emphasis is on the word all. So turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 7. It says, verse 16, admittedly, this is a little bit hard for us to comprehend, and ungodly people will take verses like this and use it as a justification for them to be horrible people. We understand that. But you have to understand the people of Israel, the people of Canaan were the descendants of Canaan who had the curse of God upon them. Their society was the most abominable society in the history of this planet. We can't comprehend it. It would be filthy even to take one minute and talk about it. In fact, they were so filthy and so wicked that God said to the people of Israel, when you go in there, don't ask them one thing about their religion and their life. Don't ask one thing, because it will pollute your mind. It's so abominable. But notice this. It says, verse 16. Well, let's get into a little bit of the context. Verse 14, thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of these evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. And thou shalt consume all the people which the Lord thy God shall deliver thee. Thou shalt consume all the people. 
Now, the right understanding of this has to do with sin. Has to do with sin. This has to do with tolerating sin, putting up with sin, living alongside of sin, having a, a, having a, um, uh, a low view of sin, or separating from sin 100%. That's what it's saying. All. All. All means all. He says, this is the secret of your success. This is the secret for you to possess all the land. What needs to be done? There needs to be destruction of all sin. A separation of from all sin. A complete annihilation of sin. You know, that's the opposite of man. You know, they say, drink in moderation. What they're really saying, sin in moderation. That's the world's view. Sin in moderation. You know, it's okay. Just do what's socially acceptable. Do what everybody else is doing. It's okay. No. There's this complete destruction of sin. Now we need to focus on this a minute. Turn to chapter 7, verse 25. See how this looks. It says, The graven images of their gods shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein, for it is an abomination to the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination into thy house, lest thou be cursed thing, be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly destroy, detest it, thou shalt utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. Now, here's the secular mindset. Well, man, look at that. Let's take the gold off of that. You know? Let's take the gold off of that. Yeah, let's, let's destroy the idol, but let's take the gold off of it. God said no. No way. You just destroy that thing completely. Don't think any good thing of it at all. So here's this guy. You know, he's got all this collection of rotten music. And he gets saved. And someone says, well, sell it on eBay. God says, burn it up. That's what God says. He says, utterly destroy it. Now you say, that's really radical. Yeah. It, admittedly so. Because the word all is radical. 
But you know, to give yourself all out for a business, that's not radical. To give yourself all out to get, you know, A's, that's not radical. To give yourself all out, you know, to be a great sports star, that's not radical. But to obey the Bible, to do what the Bible says, oh, that's radical. And so he says the first key to possessing all the land is having the right view of sin. Having the right view of sin. You know what? The fact is, us parents, that's where we fail. Now, I was thinking about this this last week, and I won't say exactly what it is, but I thought, you know, that one thing that I tolerated was a snare to my children. Destroy them all. Now notice the second great principle, and we've already alluded it to, is complete obedience to all of God's commands. A complete obedience to all of God's commands. A complete separation from all that which is evil. A complete obedience of all of God's commands. And this is, uh, you know, this is just everywhere in the book of Deuteronomy. And maybe you would want to read the first 10 chapters and just circle the word all. Chapter 5 and verse 33. Well, let's go back a little bit. <laughs> verse um, 29. Deuteronomy 5. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep. Why don't you read the next word, word for me? All my commandments, all ways. That it might be well with them. They might possess all the land, put it there, with their, with their what? Children. Huh, there we go. There's our failure, adults. We want our children to obey but we didn't have it ourselves. We didn't have it ourselves. All. All the commandments. Verse 33 of chapter 5. Ye shall walk in, supply the word, the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may live you might possess all the land. All. Verse 2 of chapter 6. Thou mightest, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep his statutes and his commandments. It's just everywhere. All. 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 It's not too profound. But it is clear. It is clear. All. The Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. You know, we are living in a day in which Christians are so smart. Oh, they are so smart. Oh, the Bible doesn't mean that. The Bible doesn't say that. That doesn't mean that. It means something else. You know, you ever figure out that God said what he meant and he meant what he said? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to read your Bible. The sad thing is all these people who know better 
who are taught better. Yeah, they're throwing away big parts of the Bible. And they're glorying in how wonderful it is in their liberty. But let me tell you one thing. They don't have a clue as how it's going to turn out. They don't have a clue how it's going to turn out. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, yeah, they'll start finding out how it's going to turn out. But you know what? That's the difference between faith and obedience. And our, I've said this before, our dear brother Joe Raines, his history at McQuanago Baptist Church What's wrong with that Joe Reigns? What's wrong with him? You know, of course, the way they put it, he just does what the pastor says. I won't use the adjectives that they used. But you know, now we get to see how it turned out. Back in those days, those, those critical words seemed really like they knew what they were talking about. But that's not how life works. You see, faith works in segments of 20 and 40 years. The results of faith are always seen years down the road. It takes faith to obey all the Bible. It takes human skepticism and human foolishness to pick and choose which parts of the Bible that you are smart enough to obey and the other parts that you don't have to obey. And you know what? It takes a real smart person to figure out which sins you can leave in your life and which sins you need to get rid of. You know what I mean? But the fact is, nobody's smart enough because the very sin that you and I leave in our life is probably the very one that will be the, room, the one that destroys us. So... He says, destroy all the enemies. He says, obey all the Bible. And he says, keep all your heart. Keep all your heart. Deuteronomy 13 says, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you. To know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now here's context. So here's this person that claims to be a prophet, and what they say comes to pass. But the rest of what he says is in violation to the Bible. Or part of what he says is in violation of the Bible. And God says, you know what? I'm going to let one of those things that that false prophet said, I'm going to let one of them come to pass so I can test you. So I can test you. So I can test your heart. <clears throat> To see if you will obey me in everything. You know what God says? Had to keep all your heart. Now we have never instances in the Bible. We find about the church at Ephesus. Oh, there's a lot of good things about the church at Ephesus. 
It says, but I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. Keep all your heart. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. All your heart. Now, this is going to be um, a pretty clear judge, judgment situation. All your heart. Okay? Was there a time in your life that you loved listening to the Bible more than you do now? Was there a time in your life when you were so anxious to hear the Bible you couldn't wait to get to church? You say, oh, pastor, you were better back then. You were more interesting back then. I uh, might be, but I think it's probably something else. Was there a time when you loved to read your Bible more? You couldn't wait to read your Bible? Man, you just devoured it. What happened to your heart? Was there a day when you thought about souls and you went down that road and you saw people or you would see houses and when you went by those houses you used to think about the souls inside of those houses. Now, you don't think about the souls inside of the houses. You think about how beautiful the house is and how maybe you'd like to have one like it. You don't think about their souls. You know, we go on the whole list. <coughs> Worship. Worship. You know, we, we come here to worship God. You know, to listen to a sermon, it's, you know, it's meant to be a choice. It's not meant to be entertainment. It's meant to be a choice. You decide, I want God to speak to my heart. Worship. Yeah, keep your heart. You know, first thing. Prayer, prayer meeting goes. Come to prayer meeting, but can't stay for prayer. Then Sunday school goes. Oh, I got, I got, I got sleep in. That's not kind of boring anyhow. I think I know better what the preacher should be preaching on. I don't like the subjects. You know? Then pretty soon, Wednesday night all together. Then, it's Sunday night. Oh, come on. I got something better to do. Go to church two hours on Sunday night. And then you go out Sunday morning. Well, actually, it starts off with, you know, they don't get here at 1025. They get here at quarter 11. You know? You know what I'm saying? You know what it's called? Cardiac arrest. Heart failure. Something's happened to the heart. He says, um, you need to serve God with all your heart. Now, we think of heart as emotions. That's really not true. In the Bible, if you want to talk about emotions, the Bible uses the word bowels. But when he talks about the heart, 
He's talking about a vital, vital organ of your soul. And you know, the heart is kind of the, the, the center part. It's the, the center of the decider. It's the decider, the center of the wanter. You know, um, why is the heart so important? Because if your heart isn't right, you can't make any decisions for God. You can't make decisions for God. You know, the Christian life, did you know, the Christian life is about decisions. You make decisions, you respond to God, you obey God, you decide to obey God. But you know, there's some people, they haven't made decisions in years. You know why? Because their heart is hard. You ever witness to someone? I've witnessed to people. And they say, you know, I know I need to accept Christ. I know that I have to accept Christ to be born again, but I can't do it. I say, I understand. You got a hard heart. You can't do it. You know, if you don't do it, you go to hell, but you can't do it. Because you know what? Their, their decider is all messed up. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes we get to that place that our decider is all messed up. We know what's right, but we can't decide to do right. Our decider got messed up. And the Bible says the key to living for God and having God's blessing is to keep all your heart. Not just part of it. All your heart. That heart needs to be guarded. That heart needs to be guarded. Boy, there's a lot of things that want to take that heart, isn't there? You know, a little money might do it. A little money. Oh, boy. People see a dollar bill. And man, who? Some people see a little bit of acceptance by the world. Oh, man, that's great. Whatever it is, sin. Oh, man, sin looks really appealing to the heart, the old heart. You let it come in, all of a sudden you have heart to... Uh, Failure really fast. Won't be able to breathe very good spiritually. Isn't it amazing? And there's some alls here. Now think about this principle. Uh, all. Do you know that the, the idea of all is the key to salvation? Luke chapter 18. Here's a rich man. Well, excuse me. Here's a, um, a ruler who comes to Jesus. But he's rich. Verse... 18 of chapter 18, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I wonder, would you have answered the question the way he did? You would have said, Repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. But Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good, save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and mother. Of course, Jesus specifically eliminated one Commandment. You know what it was? Thou shalt not covet. And the man said, I, All of these have I kept from my youth up. 
Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou... What? One thing. One thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now notice the importance of all. There was one thing. There was just one thing in the way. Just one thing in the way. And you know that one thing made the difference between heaven and hell. One thing. All's in God's book. All is at the top of God's vocabulary. Now what about discipleship? Turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, 57. It came to pass as they went on their way, a certain man said to him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Sounds pretty good, right? Lord, I surrender my life. I just been to the coal of clash. I surrender my life. That's good. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Jesus said, foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. What is he saying? <coughs> so, oh, yeah. You said you'd follow me anywhere. But you know what? If you have to give up your pillow... In a nice house, in the comforts of life, that's where it ends. Boxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests, but the son of man, he didn't even own his own house. He said, the problem is, I know your heart. There's one thing in your heart that means more to you than following me. There's one thing in your heart that means more to you than following me. So what's he saying? You know what? Everything has to be surrendered. He doesn't mean that we have to give up everything. He might ask us to, though. But a disciple... All on the altar is laid. No reservations. No areas, untouchables. All on the altar is laid. Jesus said, Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
wholly acceptable unto God. Which is your reasonable service. And of course, what's the picture? If you take your life and you lay it on the altar, you, you sa- give your body a living sacrifice. You know what? Everything about you and I is contained in this body. Everything. That's what he's saying. That's what it means to be a disciple. My hands, my eyes, my ears, everything in my life. The key to do discipleship. You know, it's the key to spiritual growth. Did you know that? It's the key to spiritual growth. I think of uh, that great verse in Proverbs 5, verse 8. Keep thy ways far from her. You know that little thing of worldliness you want to hang on to? Going to keep you from growing. Going to keep you from growing. That one little thing keep you from growing. It'll, it'll snap you, snag you. It'll snare you. It'll rob you. One little thing. You know, the Christian life is really amazing, isn't it? You take ten different people. And ten different people have ten different areas in their life that's got a hold on their soul wrongfully. You know what I mean? And so... It's simple. This person who says he's saved says, you know what? I'm not going to go to that church because I want to go to the dance. This person says he's saved. I'm not going to go to that church because I want to listen to my rock music. This person says, I'm not going to go to that church because I want to drink my alcohol. This person says, I'm not going to go to that church because, you know what? I want my girly magazines. You make the list. If you had a list like that and it's real, no church would preach against any sin. And so what people do... They tolerate churches that don't preach against sin just because they got one sin in their life. They won't give up. Do they possess the land? Do they possess the land? They don't possess the land. They don't possess the land. You know, all is a small word, but it's big in God's economy. All. How many Christians? They say, just like this man, I'll follow thee wheresoever thou goest, but Jesus finished the statement, but you won't when it comes to where you have to lay your head. It won't. You know, it was a t- I remember the day there was a fella, a preacher preached in our chapel at Bible college, and he preached about going to New York City and starting churches. And I sitting there, I'm a country boy. I'm a farm boy. And I said, that is the last place in the world I will ever want to live. In fact, when I was in seminary, I lived in a metropolis suburb of Oakland. And about drove me crazy. But I remember sitting there in Bible college. Saying, Lord, I don't want to go to New York City. Lord, I don't want to go to New York City. But I know I can't say no to you. I can't say no. 
That'd be the end of my life if I decide that I'm going to say no to you. So I said, Lord, okay, if that's what you want, I say yes. Hope you don't. <laughs> but Lord, I'll do it. Because God's in the all business. All business. As we close this message, let me ask you a question. How's all doing in your life? Are you the, do you know the God of all? Or do you have this kind of Christianity that you're really the boss? God, you can have my life, but not here, not here, not here, not here. God, you can be the boss of my life, but I'm not going to separate from that, not going to separate from that, not going to separate from that. God, I love you, but I'm not going to give you all my heart. No way. Guess what? The problem is, the God of the Bible is the God of all. The joy, the peace, the wonder, the blessing of all. What did he say? All these commandments, you'll live. <laughs> right? All! You'll live. You have blessing. I trust Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. Maybe Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart in a, special, in a general way. And just that, that a reminder, okay, Lord, you got my all. Maybe the Holy Spirit tried to prick at one of your gods. One of your gods that you love so much. And you love so much that you will push away the God of the Bible. Maybe your God is your mind. Maybe your God is some sin of the world. Maybe your God is disobedience, lack of separation. I don't know. Maybe the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart and said, you know what? The Lord doesn't have all my heart anymore. Don't blame it on somebody else. If we lost part of our heart, it's because we, we let it happen. We let it happen. Don't blame somebody else. Lord, I let my heart go. Lord, I let this thing take my heart away. You know, it needs to go back right where it needs to go back right to us. Perhaps today, the Lord's encouraging you. Say, you know what? I can have God's best for my life. I'm going to be in the all camp. Amen? Maybe you're a young person. You're going to say, you know what? I'm going to give God all my life. I'm not going to save my youth for myself and give God the leftovers. Right now, I'm going to give my life to God. As a young person, all, that's where God, you know, for all of us, there's another all. It's called the rest of our life. I'm going to give all the rest of my life to the Lord Jesus. Whenever failures in the past, it's, it's behind me. The rest is for God. Isn't it great? That God is so merciful. He even take us. When we've been rebellious, he'll take us today for the rest of our life that we might accomplish all that he has for us.
from this point on. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the word of God. Lord, what a great truth it is. Lord, it touches the innermost realities of our heart, this word all. Oh God, it touches the real us. It touches the reality of who's really God. If we are trying to usurp your authority, we're trying to usurp your, your glory for ourselves. Oh, if we really, I want you to be all. And Lord, I pray for that precious soul that's here. There's a God in their life that's more important to them than Jesus and his salvation. I pray today that they would see that's just a lie of the devil. It's just plain old sin. And that they would be willing to turn from that false God and turn to Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. I pray for that believer today that their, their growth has been stunted because they listen to some other, some other so-called Christian who says, oh, you don't have to do that. And all got taken out of their vocabulary. Lord, I pray today would be a day of victory. They'd say yes. I pray that, Lord, that we would do some inspection of our heart today and see if it's all working or if we've let something get into our heart that keeps us from being able to obey you, to do right, to love you, to love the things of God, to love walking with you. Lord, Lord, help us to see that little thing, oh, it's just one little thing, one little germ can kill a life. One little sin can kill a heart. <clears throat> With heads bowed and eyes closed, this Lord is speaking to your heart. What's that? Is that lack of all a big thing? Or is it a little thing? But God is speaking to you about all. All. The sins you will not forsake, all need to be forsaken. All his word needs to be obeyed. All his heart, our hearts need to be guarded. Say, Pastor, pray for me. The Lord spoke in my heart today. I need to deal with this all, and by God's grace today, I want to. Maybe you're here and you really sense your inability and you want prayer. On the other hand, maybe it's a clear decision. The Lord has brought you to place, and there's that thing in your life. And you say, okay, it's time, Lord. I'm not hanging on to it anymore. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, you say, Pastor, pray with me. God knows my heart. I'm surrendering that thing that's in the way of all today. Anyone here today? Pastor, pray for me. I'm surrendering that thing that's in the way of all today. Okay? I see a number of hands. God bless you. Others? Amen. Amen. Put those hands down. How about you? God, I'm surrendering that thing that's in the way of all. That's keeping you from being what you need to be in my life. Keeping me from growing, keeping me from prospering. Maybe it's keeping you from repenting of your sins and accepting Christ. Pastor, pray for me. God, speak in my heart. I'm desirous to get rid of that, that thing or things that's keeping me from being in the all category. Anyone else? God has spoken to your heart. Lord, I thank you for speaking to hearts. Oh, Lord, 
in your mercy that you could visit us today. What a great thing it is. And what a great thing it is, Lord, when your Holy Spirit is able to touch at the vitals of a heart and that you're able to be the God that you want to be. Now, Lord, oh, Lord, might you be glorified. Might you give victory. Lord, sin will fight back. The devil will fight back. I pray that you'll give grace. Lord, help those deciders to be clear and strong today. And might you be glorified as the secrets of the heart are are dealt with before a holy God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Pastor John.